Matt uh, here, Cricket. I'm one of the pediatric otolaryngologists down at Emory University and Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And we're going to go through some head and neck masses today and touch on exit procedures a bit. So our objectives are going to be to identify some of the common masses that are found in the feet up, head and neck, to understand how those problems progress in the prenatal, perinatal period, and be able to correctly identify patients who are candidates for either exit or presto delivery. So when we look at neck masses or head and neck masses in the fetus, they're, they tend to be classified in a couple of different manners. Um, certainly we want to know where the problem is. We want to know what it has. What are the sort of intricate characterizations of the lesion itself? If it's um, and then where is it in terms of laterality on the baby? That has implications for both differential diagnosis and for your management, depending on how the baby lies within the uterus. So workup starts always with standard ultrasound. Um, in some cases, will progress to high resolution or a 3D ultrasound. Um, 4D ultrasound is something that there is in a clips where you see actual movement. Um, that can be really valuable in these patients to look at swab, fetal swab movements uh, and look at the baby's movement overall. Those are all within your arsenal. Um, some patients will then progress to needing MRI. So this is, the availability of fetal MRI is certainly institution specific. Usually this is done at a children's center rather than at a uh, obstetric or adult hospital. So usually registered as a patient at the children's facility and then the MRI will be performed there. So to, to want an MRI would be you know, significant concern for airway compression or anatomic abnormalities going with the head, the scalp, the jaw, um, and the facial structure. Because we're, we've gotten better and better at diagnosing these lesions prenatally, the outcomes for these babies has improved significantly. 20% of babies with a large head and neck mass would have been expected to survive, but now the at least perinatal outcome are much better. Sorry about that. So when, you know, some examples, um, uh, you know, cystic lesions are very nicely seen on the prenatal imaging, even just with simple ultrasound, you can see here the difference between the cyst on the screen. That's actually a bronchogenic cyst. Whereas on the right side, you see something a little bit more um, sedated. Let me see here. Uh, Looks like some of but maybe. Um, so on the right side, we see a little bit more septated, which is actually a teratoma. We um, the location of these masses into the anterior neck and the posterior neck with different diagnoses depending on where you are. Now, anterior and posterior classically is um, the SCM is used as a dividing line for that, but can be pretty tricky to use in a fetus and so oftentimes radiologists will use the bony ear canal itself as the demarcating line between anterior and posterior. Solid masses are common and almost always are vascular in origin. So, these are not tear common, right? Um, we're dealing with somewhere between one and 20, one and eight hours when you talk about um, significant head and neck masses. Uh, they tend to be diagnosed in the second trimester. 
although after that standard 20 week ultrasound. So uh, you can imagine a, a, a traditional passage through um, prenatal care for a mother would be confirmatory ultrasound in the first anatomy scan coming at around 20 weeks. And then in absence of other risk factors, the you could conceive progress through the rest of the pregnancy without any further imaging. Um, if use kind of bedside ultrasound in the office to check on things, but you could conceivably miss that whole second, third trimester in terms of imaging if you don't have kinds of polyhydramnios or um, abnormal growth of the fetus or any other kind of indicators in the mom, something might be. So the most common things to that are found are certainly the um, hemangiomas, just like in, in babies after they're born, it's most common tumor. Teratomas are the second most common and we kind of progress down through some of the more rare things. And we'll go more on things in detail and just touch briefly on some of the more rare ones. Um, we think about a little bit differently than we do these sort of intrinsic or infiltrative lesions. About that. I don't know what's going on. Let me see if I can uh, get in the fast forward preview. About one second. We'll find our second. Thanks for patience. Um, and then you can have sort of abnormal formation of normal structures in the fetus that can also lead to problems. What kind of baby, and for, for those who are not familiar, that stands for ex utero intrapartum treatment. So that is basically when a modified cesarean section is performed on the mom. The baby is partially delivered through a hysterectomy, but left attached to the placenta, and the majority of the baby's body is actually left inside the uterus to um, to signal through the uterus that the baby has been delivered. Um, and so we basically use the placenta as bypass while it's being oxygenated through the placenta. Once the airway is secured, then um, the Useful. So that's an exit procedure in brief. Um, babies who may be candidates for this are those have imaging that suggest that there's complete occlusion of the airway. So some kind of tracheal atresia or complete obstruction. Losses or teratomas. And we'll talk in a moment about why teratomas are a little bit more difficult to manage than some of the other lesions. Um, well, part of the reason is that it is a big ordeal to get an exit procedure together. So this is a inside our bars um, prior to procedure, and usually there's somewhere between, you know, in the in the realm of thirty people, probably uh, in the room when this is going on. So it's very crowded. Um, a lot of resources, both physical resources and in the time of providers that are not doing something else. Uh, and as you can imagine, just sort of logistically those people together. Oftentimes, uh, you know, even when you go through the literature on these seizures, a lot of the fetuses who were thought to need this were just intubated during, uh, very simply intubated during this um, procedure. So we want to try to find the patients who need it and use this therapy for people who need it and then try to avoid unnecessary for those who can't. So Lazar's group really cares objectively who might need an exit procedure by going through and creating this metric called the tracheoesophageal placement index. And so basically what we're doing is assuming that the tracheoesophageal complex belongs right in front of the spine here, the cervical they were looking at um, both in the AP dimension and in the lateral dimension, what is your displacement location? And can that displacement by, you know, by whatever mass you're dealing with be used as a curve? 
difficult and debate who might get the extra therapy. And so when you add together that lateral and ventral displacement, they got a mean of somewhere in the um, range of about four millimeters and found that if you got up over 12, then you were really looking at patients who would be a little bit more complicated to intubate. So not perfect, but just a nice uh, little adjunct in your decision making if you're struggling. Uh, we also will at times really presto delivery, which is a little acronym for just basically having ENT and feeding the seat on standby in the operating room. So instead of the normal exit setup, which is what you see here, where we have, you know, multiple pediatric ENTs, multiple maternal fetal medicine uh, providers, and a resuscitation team, ultrasound, all this stuff, um, what we'll do is just let the maternal fetal team deliver the baby via standard C-section and be there uh, if it looks like the child is going to need some resuscitation, we can them over to the resuscitation corner and do some standard airway intervention over there. So that's a little bit less risky for the mom. It requires a significant expenditure of time resource, uh, but uh, doesn't deviate as a typical OB intervention for just a C-section three. Right, we're going to go to lesions now. Um, for these exophytic lesions, teratomas we talked about need a little bit of special, right? Um, not particularly common, like we said, but it is the most common solid mass in the anterior compartment. And they are defined by having components of all three germ layers within them. So they can be mature, immature, be more lesions are more homogeneous lesions, whereas the mature ones might have actual visible structures or identified structures from the different germ layers in there. They have very rare malignant potential, so patients will typically be followed by oncology after delivery, but it is, like I said, exceedingly rare. So one of the reasons that we care about in particular is that these be a little bit more solid. Even if they do have um, cystic components, they have um, a compressor, which means that they can both cause more deformation of the fetal anatomy and more trouble for the operator if you're trying to intubate a baby. They're a little bit harder to move out of the way or harder to just kind of squish out of the way your scope or ET tube. So much more likely to need surgical airway intervention than a baby with, say, a large lymphatic malformation at birth. Um, they do need relatively urgent management after delivery because they have intrapural hemorrhage, which can lead to sudden enlargement and their resection significantly more difficult, but the at risk for development of um, like a high output cardiac failure sort of situation. So this is a baby who was delivered via exit and was able to be into transorally at that time. You can see that the native tongue is kind of outlined here, really pushed over to the side. And the tongue is predominantly within the floor pushing the tongue up and over to the side. We were able to get around over here. Um, but again, because there's this risk for hemorrhage and sudden enlargement, this is obviously not a very evil situation we have here. And that was resected on the, the baby's first day of life. Um, and complete resection is typically curative. Again, they are followed to ensure there's no recurrence and to malignant potential, but complete resection is usually all they need. So operatively, um, the main issues that we're concerned about are actually pulmonary. So 
infants who have a significant degree of airway obstruction during development, you can have pulmonary hyperplasia of varying degrees. I mean, sort of think about the analogous general diaphragmatic hernia, where it's really the lung pathology and the lack of normal pulmonary later on. There can be some long-term effects of air digestive tract compression in terms of the uh, abnormal anatomy. Uh, and then you have the sequelae of the, la the mass actually being in place. So the cleft palate in some of these patients that have a large oral mass during development because the palatal shelves can't close. Uh, you can have mandibular refilling and some issues. Uh, but it is important to remember that oftentimes you're delivering a baby that is, you know, pre There's a lot of growth development that's going to happen in that postnatal period. And this is that same baby that you just saw, um, it just spun, you know, she had her surgery obviously, but everything that you see here is just spontaneous resolution remodeling uh, of her deformity. Um, she did need a solid bit of speech therapy and swallowing therapy because of the feeder and has had um, relatively normal speech development with the help of that therapy. Molding, so a very, very large oral mass can cause deformation of the mandible, the way that it grows, and so you can be left with a mouth that stays open all the time just because that's the bony structure of it. And so, in those children, sometimes you use or slings to kind of assist with repositioning of the mouth and helping it stay closed uh, as they grow. So we talked about monitoring from protein is the typical blood test that is used to monitor these babies afterwards. They have levels, all babies have very, very high level of the perinatal period, slightly higher even amongst premature babies. And so normative parts by the Hemong team where they're looking for an expected fall in the it's more, really more important than the absolute value is the trajectory of decrease over time. And to see them fall to within normal range or normal levels as they get out towards uh, a year of age, that's relatively reassuring. Um, they do really get followed up until about age two, but that first several months to year of decrease is um, where we're really kind of concentrating our efforts. And then um, imaging follow-up, again, not a lot of to guide practice, but typically um, they will have, you know, some imaging follow-up in those first of life. We're not seeing any return. Epignathus is often cited as a separate lesion, but it's really just a mature teratoma. Um, so it is, you know, technically of the man, but um, is the name that's often applied to very mature teratomas that have identifiable structures within them, the fetus and feto, where there's, you know, like I swallowed my twin, <laughs> where you might have um, organs. There's, there's like, as I said, very kind of mature tissue within the teratoma. That's um, where epignathus is typically used as a label. Um, because these come are tethered to the anterior bony structures of the face, they tend to be more exophytic. So when quite large, they may not be causing much in the way of airway obstruction. That's where your MRI um, or um, Cine ultrasound can be very helpful if you can um, watch for swallowing movements, the airway, these lesions, uh, then you know that you're going to have a little bit more leeway after delivery. Uh, hemangiomas, on the other hand, uh, are more common on the posterior aspect of the neck. They are as we know, the most common type of childhood tumor. Uh, hemangiomas, though, are fully formed at birth. So in contrast to the sort of typical infantile ones that present a few months after birth, 
formed, baby is born, and it can be divided up into rapidly involuting types and non type. So it's not as obvious that it's going to go away as it is in the infantile hemangiomas. That requires a little bit of watching and see. Um, they tend to be solid appearing on imaging, which you can see in both the ultrasound and MRI. And they have this kind of variable echo texture on the ultrasound, obviously with vasculature avidly enhancing on contrast weighted MRI. So hemangiomas, uh, depending on their to significant complications for the fetus or the baby, um, in, including heart failure or consumption of the uh, and so then you can also see potentially some of the complications of into heart failure such as non-immune high drops that develops within the fetus. Um, polyhydramnios tends to be a obstruction of the airway and we're not having normal fetal swelling of lung fluid and that tends to be in primary hypoplasia. So there's abnormal vascular anatomy that you can see fairly well here in, in the post period. Um, if surgery is needed, then it, embolization can be considered depending on the size of the base. Propranol is still used in these, although in non involuting types, it might not be quite as successful. Congenital epilis is um, a germ cell tumor, essentially, of the anterior gingiva. Um, these are benign. They can be very large and very oxyphytic, but they're benign and just need to be excised. Uh, common in females, although it's not fully understood why that is. Um, and often isolated and give you dramatic pictures, but usually not a lot of associated health, um, health problems. Okay, so um, we're going to talk then about some of these more infiltrative or internal vascular malformations are certainly the most common. Um, you will see when you look in your obstetric literature, some of the older otolaryngology literature, that these are often termed cystic hygromas. So they're commonly um, applied to macrocystic LMs, oftentimes in the posterior compartment. Um, and they are maybe more or less likely to be associated with fetal aneuploidy. So those that are noted in the second trimester are uh, oftentimes associated with these chromosomal non disjunctions, um, whereas if they are noted later in the development, it's oftentimes thought to be just a failure of the lymphatic channels to make contact with the IJ system. So um, you're a little bit more or less concerned about the overall status of the fetus depending on when you miss it. Again, because these often uh, develop later in the pregnancy, they are a little bit higher risk for not being diagnosed prenatally. Because if you have an otherwise routine pregnancy in a healthy mother, she may not be a term ultrasound to notice this. You know, lungs are divided up into slow flow and fast flow lesions. Um, really the same delineations that we have later on in childhood. Uh, but it's important to remember that the vascular malformations are not the same as vascular tumors. Vascular tumors are really defined by increased cell turnover uh, as opposed to the malformations or malformations of the vessels but it's not necessarily a, you may have a dilating lesion, but it's not a growing lesion in terms of uh, actual cell vision. This is a nice, nice chart that just kind of goes through the different imaging findings that are expected with the different vascular lesions. 
Again, this is applicable to both prenatal and postnatal uh, life, but you expect the tumors are going to have really vigorous enhancement. The higher flow lesions are going to have the signal voids on the MRI that go along with that. Um, and all the, any of the vascular lesions are going to have more Doppler activity, whereas the um, sort of cystic and we talked about previously would not have as much flow. So same as in um, the postnatal world, we divide these into micro and macro cystic. You know, cysts one centimeter or smaller are typically defined as microcystic. Um, when you get these big mixed cysts, that talk oftentimes about the predominating pattern. Um, obviously, these macrocysts are a bit easier to manage. And may be addressed either surgically or via sclerotherapy, whereas the microcystic lesions are usually going to be um, handled with some targeted therapy and then pharmacologic therapy. So, um, enlargement, expansion with infection, uh, or just slow enlargement over time in the absence of infection with um, ridge. Um, so they can be observed depending on where they are. Certainly getting the baby out of the postnatal period, if it's in a non-critical location, is not really causing symptoms, is fine and normal. That um, if I go back, the cyst is kind of in the supraclavicular fossa here. And so that was just observed for uh, about 18 months until the family was comfortable with the baby undergoing some sedation to have sclerotherapy. Um, this is uh, an IR image of the needle kind of going into the cyst where they'll aspirate out the contents and then re-inject uh, a pro-inflammatory agent. That, which agent is used will depend a little bit on where the airway, I'm sorry, where the lesion is in reference to the airway and just where it's comfortable with. Um, certain agents are a little bit less likely to cause edema after. So if you're really involved with the airway, you may end up using something like bleomycin, which has some side effects associated with it, but much less airway swelling. Whereas if you're farther away, you may use an alcohol-based solution uh, or other um, uh, sclerosins that might be, have a little bit more swelling associated with them afterwards. Uh, for patients with microcystic disease, certainly sirolimus has really taken over as a therapy of choice in a lot of patients. You remember that it does come with some immunosuppression. And so, especially in the perinatal period when the babies are going to be out for infection anyway, it needs to be used carefully. Um, it can be used in neonates just with very close monitoring. So this is a baby who had a significant lymphatic malformation that able to intubate and hope, hopefully this um, video will play for you. So even though it's relatively, well, you'll see that the larynx itself is not entirely normal looking. Um, the fetal larynx, well, oftentimes you'll see a sort of curled appearance to it, almost as though they have a lot of laryngomalacia. There tends to be a lot of very thick amniotic You need to be prepared to really um, have a larger bore suction maybe than you would choose for a baby of that size. Here in this particular patient, you can see this sort of blunting of the angles of the uh, laryngeal framework. Um, just lymphatic enlargement all the way around. Right, so this is during the X. You can see not really able to see the cords, but able to push through uh, and get a tube in. So um, even though an entirely normal, it's a baby that was able to be intubated and then um, about, I think around 28 weeks gestation, so quite premature. We tried to let him grow for a bit, but he had really the lesion. 
which required surgery um, maybe at about two weeks of age. Um, so there wasn't any way to get out of it because it just kept getting bigger and bigger. However, um, even though this thing was big, around a year old, you can see he's in the office and a pretty happy, healthy kid. Uh, now, I would be remiss if I said he was perfect as um, his lesion uh, went all the way back to the cervical spine and had the esophagus displaced to and um, the musculature of the SCM and the platysma totally attenuated, very thin. And so definitely because of right-sided SCM dysfunction, he does have a right-sided cord paralysis um, as, you know, likely due to his surgery, although could have been due to like, displacement, stretch and training development. Um, so he has some things to work through, but uh, overall is doing So some of the more unusual internal lesions, um, congenital, congenital goiters can be seen either because of dyshormonogenesis within the fetus or because of transplacental passage of either antibodies or goitrogen. Um, or get duplications, I'm oh, sorry, these oftentimes resolve, um, may require treatment, and these are um, great candidates usually for presto delivery, right, just having someone around just in case there's an issue. Um, and are relatively uncommon. Um, they tend to be simple cysts in the mediastinum if you have esophageal duplication cysts as well. Um, CCAMs, the congenital cystic adenomatoid malformation, can also be, those are usually causing more of a pulmonary hypoplasia though and are less, a little bit less likely to require us involved uh, from the get-go. So you can also have abnormal formation of so I think that's the most common thing that we all think about. Um, you basically have a functional upper airway obstruction due to the very small ball with retrograde dysfunction of the tongue. Um, this causes both superior and post of the tongue and can come with or without pure band sequence. Uh, the main finding is the hydromio. So even in um, someone who's not familiar looking with fetal MRIs, you can see these very large pockets of this fetus, which is often what tips off the obstetrician in this case. So, uh, in the neonatal period, many of these babies can be managed just with prone positioning or nasal bits. Um, if intubation or extra ventilatory support is required, then you have the option of intubating through an LA. Please um, Tracheostomy is usually reserved for very severe cases. Uh, institution then distraction is typically attempted before proceeding to trach. Um, and some other you know, congenital abnormalities that would need tracheostomy for management. Uh, I think it's important to remember that while head and neck masses like teratomas and lymphatic malformations are typically found in isolation, micronathia the majority of the time is fetal anomalies. So um, if you look at studies, anywhere between two thirds and 100% of babies will have uh, things wrong with them. And so you may be dealing with more than just the anatomic airway obstruction when you go about your surgical decision making for these children. Chaos or the congenital high airway obstruction syndrome is the manifestation of airway obstruction. And so that's when you have complete obstruction of the upper gate. And really this kind of designation if you have that complete obstruction and you have then the sequelae of abnormal fluid, this will be um, complete occlusions at some point in the upper airway, like a laryngeal web or an atresia or a trachea. So if you remember, the you know there's amniotic fluid that comes from the placenta. There's also fetal lung fluid that is made within the 
And so if you have an obstruction of outlet for this, then the fetal lungs become very, very large and echogenic because they're fluid that can escape. And eventually that leads to flattening or even eversion of the diaphragm as the lungs fill up with fluid. Airways. Uh, as the heart needs to pump against this resistant, you can progress fetal ascites and hops, which is a poor prognostic sign. So this is a, a fetus atresia. You can see over on the right that um, air column going through the nasopharynx. This is the larynx here, which is an, but we just run into a, a complete occlusion here. And then um, you, know, you see the size of the trachea up top of the section. It's a little larger here. Even when you're looking down here at the bronchi, they're very, very, oops, sorry, very, very large, or even in the trachea itself, uh, just due to that accumulation of lung fluid. Uh, so these babies, Again, uh, if they're just left unmanaged, will eventually have demise either in utero or shortly after birth because they don't have a way to oxygenate their system. So um, that once you see that high drops development, that's really an indicator kind of heading downhill in a hurry, and that will prompt intervention. Um, to survive to term, then um, exit delivery is necessary, uh, and you have at birth followed by LTR or CTR um, once uh, once stabilized and large enough, where you can this cord of tissue that was found in the mid portion of the trachea, and then this is the distal trachea. You see how large it is compared for trachea, which is a little bit more normally sized for a baby of that age. Um, we did have to do a partial sternotomy to get below this to secure the airway. Um, in a small baby like this, it's just done with Mayo scissors. Um, assistance from our pediatric surgery team to help with that part. Um, but they set some hurdles ahead of them. So, you know, uh, survival beyond a year can be very high in some cases or really can be compromised by their lung development. So the exit procedure in itself was developed not to treat fetal airway obstruction, but to treat uh, iatrogenic airway obstruction. So part of a treatment for congenital diaphragmatic hernia, where you have compressed extra compression in the early 90s, they started using plugs or clips to create chaos syndrome, essentially. So to keep fetal lung fluid in lungs, facilitate their development, um, and kind of push back against the abdominal contents that would otherwise be compressing them. And so the exit procedure was developed as a way to remove that iatrogenic tracheal occlusion properly. That's done either usually with a balloon, a clip, or a plug. Uh, and then it was really adapted for use in some major pathologies in the later 90s. Uh, at the same time, uh, over Europe, the, the same thing was being developed. And I think this was just sort of um, a game of who has the better ac acronym. Oops. Uh, is the same idea if you see that in the literature, but just as a really unfortunate terminology uh, want uh, associate with their surgery. And so EXIT has really gained traction as the acronym of choice to describe this. So indications like we talked about earlier are these, um, you know, large teratomas, any mass that's larger than um, polyhydramnios or other signs that the um, fetal swallowing is not taking place. So the gastric is one of those, or um, if you're able to see either on Cine MRI or, or a 4D ultrasound that swallowing is abnormally not taking place, um, or there's no, there's no fetal fluid flow with those swallowing movements, then that could be due to 
And then some of these chaos findings like the hyperexpanded lungs or the, the flattened diaphragm uh, or other anatomic abnormalities that are really helping to anticipate that there can be significant difficulty with obtaining airway or um, the baby supporting itself in the post period. So who's involved? Um, a lot of people, like I said, um, this is a table from a paper that really I would say is sort of the minimum number, but you essentially need, um, you have your OB team that's gonna be attending to the mother and you have your otolaryngology team or pediatric surgery team in uh, the nation that's gonna be attending to the fetus. There is typically a neonatal resuscitation team, not just a neonatologist, but we have the whole resuscitation team. Sorry, there. Um, you're going to have scrub and circulator for both patients because they're separate surgical fields and obviously quite different instrumentation that needs to be used. An um, ophthalmographer in the OR because you need to confirm immediately prior to entering the uterus where the baby is, where uh, in a typical C-section, you know, we'll just make a low transverse incision regardless, and it tends to happen in that location, you expect more bleeding. But in this setting, we need the placenta to continue functioning throughout the intervention, or we've got to avoid. So that can lead to some non-traditional hysterotomy sites. Um, then you have your uh, right there that will be supporting afterwards and all the kind of other personnel in there. We usually have some runners who are, are in the room. Um, and then there typically needs to be a little bit of crowd control because these are unusual learners from every, um, every uh, category up and down this line. And so you have to really potentially um, same paper here. So this is just an algorithm that Dan how to proceed. Um, but in general, in, in absence of a prenatal diagnosis, can to obtain the airway in a standard way and sort of hierarchical um, progression in terms of complexity. So regular DL or um, intubation over an endoscope uh, will be different um, or attempted first. Fiber optic laryngoscopy needs to be considered with organic fluid, which is quite thick and doesn't really pass well through the tiny suction channel of a fiber optic scope that you would use in a baby of this size. And so it's a nice idea but I find, at least in our experiences, an adjunct to confirm to position afterwards, then it has been used as a way to intubate. Um, because of the kind of perils of having a trach in a newborn, especially if you're dealing with a preterm newborn, uh, I'm trach retrograde intubation. So making an incision here to find the airway and then passing either red rubber up and then um, using that to secure an additional tube that you would pass through oral and, to, and secure the airway and then closing up that tracheotomy. Uh, if you have the luxury of time, that can be a really nice way to avoid. Uh, um, although in some cases, including chaos diagnoses, um, really that you so once you have an established secure airway, then we usually fully resuscitate the baby and um, can do some decision making about whether you need postnatal imaging or whether you want to directly do resection of the lesion, depending on what it is. Um, obviously, if you don't know what it is preoperatively, then that is going to be delayed a little bit. Um, but once you have a secure airway, the um, C-section can be completed, uh, and then you really have the teams kind of separating into maternal care and, and um, care for the baby. So in terms of outcomes, um, you know, if, if we know about the time and they survive to term, then um, 
then we have relatively good outcomes for delivery. Sorry. Um, the term is easy though. Uh, most of these babies have pathology that can impact signaling within the uterus. There's a lot of either from the polyhydramnios or from other associated anomalies. And I would say probably the majority of the time, whatever day that our team has identified as a day for the walkthrough or kind of dry run turns into the procedure of a patient. So um, once these patients are known about, it's really important to activate your whole team and make sure that plans are developed because uh, the situations can progress relatively rapidly and unexpectedly. Longer term, uh, these reflect more the underlying pathology as opposed to the intraparty of management. And so, um, again, you have to think about the lung health and whatever, you know, aneuploidies or other congenital anomalies might be present. <clears throat> Neurodevelopmental outcomes are actively being studied. Um, we do, as soon as the procedure is started, attempt to monitor the baby's pulse and heart um, and oxygen saturation. Uh, there is undoubtedly some perinatal hypoxia that's occurring in the majority of these cases. So the overall impact of that is not yet known. Um, we, this is something where it's small numbers and relatively um, recent development in medical care and so long-term outcomes are as I said, still being studied. Um, I think in, in relation to this, the, the duration of placental support is also unclear in every case. You know, it can be minutes um, or a bit longer in some cases, but sometimes you're dealing with very short-term support from the placenta to really separate. So, um, uh, again, you need a lot of prior planning and ability to wrap up your different plans to optimize outcomes for these babies. Um, in terms of feeds, um, again, we talked about a little bit the pulmonary concerns about the need to try to stabilize a trach in a new um, they may need to be given neuromuscular relaxant during the procedure. It's different effects of that that might limit your ability to get good APGARs or really know how they're doing in that immediate perinatal period. And then you have um, whatever that your obstructing mass is, you have this risk for either um, enlargement due to fluid shifting and kind of lymphatic relationship, sudden hemorrhage and obstruction. So just because you get the airway secured transorally during the exit procedure doesn't really mean you know, we have to be thinking about what would happen if there was spontaneous extubation in the NICU or, or um, if you have a very tiny tube becomes obstructed with a mucus plug, you know, what are you going to do in that sense? And so that's where some of this immediate versus delayed decision um, making comes into play. For the mother, um, certainly during the procedure, you're giving a lot of relaxants, which can lead to lowering of uterine tone and therefore procedure. Postpartum hemorrhage risk, though, really may not be different from a standard C-section, although it is often seen. Um, we have to really look at the mother's fluid shifting and fluid balance after surgery. Um, Sections be more common in the exit scenario, although it's not entirely clear why that is. Um, and then uh, for subsequent pregnancies, there is elevated risk of uterine rupture. Um, we, like I said, have concerns about where the baby lies, where the anomaly is um, on the on the baby, and the, the placenta lies, you can end up with these very non-traditional hysterotomies in order to preserve placental function and avoid uh, chemical structures within the baby or the lesion. And so the mothers do need counseling about subsequent pregnancies, elevated risk. So where are we heading? Um, I think as our 
from both improvements in MRI and ultrasound to get better diagnosis, but also some technological improvements that can allow us to try to assess for airway patency prior to delivery. So virtual copy has been in some centers where they basically reformat your MRI images and um, try to see if you can chart a course through the airway uh, that doesn't involve the lesion. And a small study of that showed relatively good amenable to transoral intubation. Uh, some centers have also tried 3D printing of the upper airway anomaly to try to allow for some practice ahead of time. Um, I think that can be great in terms of getting your mind around what structure involved. Certainly printing in a material that's going to have the same distensibility as the fetal tissues and the tumor that you're dealing with is, is challenging. True fetal surgery to cor correct the issues prior to birth is being studied. Impact on long-term lung development if you can get that done while the baby is still in utero. Um, the main downside is preterm delivery uh, with manipulation of the fetus. Uh, and then there is there are some places that are trying fetus uh, with intubation prior to delivery. So basically going through a trocar like you see in the picture over here and trying to insert a 2.5 ET tube that would then stay in place through the delivery. Um, that's, um, but may require preterm delivery because the farther along you get into gestation, the more the fetal head to the maternal path, and then you're gonna um, potentially lose access to the fetal mouth during the C-section. So uh, everything comes with kind of its uh, pluses and minuses in this case but a lot of different people trying to innovate in different ways to preserve outcomes for these babies. All right, so in summary, um, um, elevated amniotic fluid levels or echogenic lungs, then we really need to look for fetal obstructive lesions, right, head and neck lesions. Um, these can be exophytic, which is more dramatic looking, but usually endophytic and infiltrative, which can be a little bit harder to manage. Um, and they need to be evaluated at multiple points. Uh, cystic lesions certainly progress during the course of pregnancy. They may uh, evolve and progress, or they may involute. Uh, lesions typically continue to grow. They may grow with the or out of proportion to the baby. So. Uh, late-term MRI may be needed, and certainly frequent ultrasounds are part of your um, part of your evaluation. And uh, like I said, when you find out about these patients within your system, you really want to kind of notify your team in which you discuss and um, serially evaluate these patients so that everyone is aware of them as soon as they come up on the radar because can evolve and progress really rapidly. Um, good to remember though, are benign uh, and excision is curative for many. Um, uh, we need to address the airway uh, and, and, and get that secured. And, and it's good to remember for your pre-op counseling that patients can have long-term swallowing difficulties or other airway problems, I think. Well, yeah, when I tried this, this is the chaos baby um, from the pictures. That the baby with the tracheal obstruction. Uh, he ended up having a slide tracheoplasty about two weeks of life, so very young age, but really just wasn't feasible to keep an endotracheal tube secured in that very still airway. And he's been a member of our air digestive clinic for some time, but uh, again, is is um, you know at the now probably three or four years old, breathing by mouth, oral feeder, you know, spent a long time in our system, but doing well. So good. Their their management doesn't end after delivery. I think that's all I have here. So a few more questions. If anybody has any 